Hi, I'm Adam. And I'm Nitan. And this is The Final Curtain, a special series of personal accounts from people who experienced the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. For today's episode, our producer travelled to one of the most secluded places in Poland to interview one of the people behind the outlawed radio station Radio Solidarność. And there, deep inside a great forest, we found a story of how courage, perseverance, and a flash of brilliance turned out to be enough to take over communist television. Coming up on The Final Curtain. Dramatic eyewitness accounts of fighting in Bucharest. Police had forcefully beaten demonstrators in East Berlin. Thousands of Czechoslovaks shaking their house keys. The protest movement is now too big to be controlled. Good evening. It is over in Poland. Iron curtain across Europe, torn down. W czerwcu albo w maju 1982 roku dostałem pocztą konspirację. June or May 1982, I got a message via the underground mail. The higher ups want to see you. If the bosses wanted to see me, then okay. I went over to where they asked me to go. And there, in this clandestine apartment, Zbigniew Bujak himself turned up. Gościem, który się zjawił, to był właśnie Zbyszek Bujak. He asked me if I was interested in starting a sort of a technical expert backbone to Solidarność in the Warsaw region. <laughs> it wasn't an easy decision because I knew that the closer I got to the boss, to the leadership, the more severe my sentence would be. <laughs> but well, seeing as I had already decided to act against the martial law and the communist regime, I couldn't really say no. Stanowi wojennemu czy reżimowi komunistycznemu, no to no to nie mogłem odmówić. No rzeczywistość wyglądała taka, że był jeden program telewizyjny, a potem drugi program telewizyjny. Państwo. The reality was that there was one TV channel and later another one. Both publicly owned, strictly censored, controlled, and that was it. There was the illegal radio Free Europe 2, a crucial station, but it was often successfully jammed. Same thing with the press. They were all government franchised. During martial law, at first there was only the Freedom Soldier, and then later People's Tribune, but it was all censored anyway. Radio miało jedną. Radio had one major advantage. It could reach not only those who were already against the regime, those who knew some people in the underground, but also those who wouldn't usually get the underground press. Even though we tried to print and give out as many magazines and leaflets as possible, we were still only reaching, I don't know, one, two, Three percent. Próbowaliśmy nadawać na UKFie, ale we tried broadcasting on VHF, but when you are broadcasting on a standard radio frequency, it's very easy to jam. So we found ourselves in this vicious circle. We gave out leaflets or put a memo in the underground press. March 12, 7.30 p.m. Radio Solidarność broadcast. And when people went to tune the radio at the time, all they could hear was a jammer. Likewise, broadcasting unannounced didn't make much sense. How many people were going to sit there tuning the knob all day looking for us? One in a million, if you were lucky. So, we thought that's a dead end. Jak teraz wyjść z tego 
błędnego koła. How do we escape this vicious circle? Well, put simply, we started broadcasting not in Warsaw itself, but just outside it. At the time, we were producing these small two watts emitters that we called genius. They could reach approximately one district. We reckoned that even if they had this powerful jammer in Warsaw, there was no way they would bring it over to Pruszkov in time, especially if we only handed out leaflets one day earlier. And indeed, that's what happened. And our broadcast started reaching listeners. And there were a lot of broadcasts. Every broadcast started with our usual tune, a snippet of a theme song we adopted for Radio Solidarność called Ex Ho, a popular protest song from World War II. <laughs> Dostaliśmy takie eksperckie opracowanie, że ile czasu tak zwane pęgowanie. We got this expert advice that it takes around six minutes to locate the emitters. So our broadcasts should be any longer than six minutes, right? Zawsze były informacje. We'll always have news about arrests, repressions, talk about those who were imprisoned, layoffs, economic conditions, but there was always a main subject to it. Let's say, today is Constitution Day, so there would be a segment about the Constitution and a fragment of a song, maybe. Like for Christmas, we we'll play the carol. Faktem było ważne, że w ogóle ta solidarność nadaje, że jest. At the time, it was just really vital that people knew solidarność were broadcasting at all. But often people didn't even remember what we'd said. W pracy do mnie kolega rozmawiał. At work one day, my colleague said to me, all excited. Radio Solidarność. Słyszałem, słyszałem. No co mówi? I heard Radio Solidarność last night. Oh yeah. What did they say? Uh, well, generally, you know, stuff against the regime, right? But they are alive. They exist. Uważałem, że najważniejsze jest nadawać. This is why I always believed that just broadcasting itself was the most important thing. We would often play, say, Bujak speeches or call for an election boycott. The commies would organize an election every once in a while, so we'd go full steam calling out. Don't be afraid, don't vote. Don't take part in this mockery, in this sham, because if there is only one choice on the list, what are you supposed to be electing? One is one, simple as that. But people still voted because they were afraid not to, not because they supported the regime, but because they were afraid they'd have their coal supply cut or have their kids kicked out of school or rejected from university applications. That's just how it was. One day, our technical team invented something I'd call a flash of Polish genius. They designed an emitter called Bill that broadcasted an electronic signal that could affect televisions. In other words, it allowed us to put a short text on the screens of people's TVs. The first one we did was Solidarność Lives. Two words, that was enough. That went out in Pruszków, and it was a major success. People thought we'd captured TV headquarters and were broadcasting from there. People didn't realize it was only in their little town, because you always think of television as something general that goes out to the entire country. 
They were opening their windows and shouting, Solidarność leaves! Solidarność has won! I today rozwiązaliśmy wreszcie te perpetuum mobile, tak? To było and that's how we escaped the vicious circle. We didn't have to tell anybody in advance anymore. Whoever had their TV on saw it. So if there was a football match, let's say Górnik Zabrze was playing against some other team, we knew everybody would be in front of their TVs watching it. So obviously we didn't bother people with it while the ball was actually in play. But when the halftime break started, bam, our message. Nie mogliśmy puścić tekstu. However, we couldn't use too many words, only a slogan. Boycott the election, the party lies, the television lies. I don't want to brag, but I think I was the one who came up with the idea of putting up the text saying, turn on your radio, Radio S is on, and we do a sequence. We turn the bill on and emit the text. Solidarność lives. Then there would be some other text, like Solidarność was having a march on May 1st or something, and then this. Turn on VHF. Radio Solidarność is on. And then we'd broadcast a full radio program from our most powerful emitter, a 50 watt Gordon. That was extremely effective. Then came the Berta emitter and... Uh, that was really the one, a bull's eye, a huge emitter, which interfered with television's audio frequencies. A person watching TV would suddenly notice the original audio dip down, and then hear that sound. Tu Radio Solidarność, tu Radio Solidarność. Tu Radio Solidarność. Tu Radio Solidarność. Dzisiejszą ósmą audycję emitujemy na częstościach 70 i 67 MHz. Audycja zostanie powtórzona we wtorek. It was just fantastic. It was pretty safe too. No need to go out on the streets and inform people in advance. Great reach, because it was 50 watts. We could safely broadcast a 5, 6 or even 7 minute long program. Całkowicie bezpiecznie. No to zaczęliśmy hulać. So, we started giving it all we had. Tu Radio Solidarność. Tu Radio Solidarność. Prosimy nie regulować telewizorów. This is Radio Solidarność. This is Radio Solidarność. Please do not adjust your television sets. The glitches you are hearing are caused by our emitters. At the end of the program, please turn your house lights on and off a few times. Ludzie byli szczęśliwi, że mogli mrugać. People were happy to turn their lights on and off for us. I heard from one of our team, Klekowski, who broadcasted the signal from a tall building in the city center that they saw the whole Warsaw blinking with lights. All those broadcasters, each and every one, will tell you that seeing that blinking was their reward for all those conspiracy life hardships. I used to stay in touch with everybody through a system of secret mailboxes that were emptied only twice a week. It meant organizing every event took an immense amount of time and effort. 
For example, say we were on our way to someone's apartment to go broadcast from it. Even if they'd previously agreed, we had to give them a heads up somehow. The telephone system at the beginning of martial law had been shut down and later on, after they started working again, we never used them. We reckoned they were all bugged. Our paranoia, or maybe it wasn't paranoia, but us being sensible, went so far that if someone was talking in a room with a phone, we'd cover the thing with a thick blanket first, right? And it was like that 1982, 3, 4, 1985, 6, 7, and until June 1989. That's seven and a half years in the conspiracy. Secret mailboxes, all those meetings, etc. Meanwhile, there is normal life out there. People living normal lives. Most people at least. Let me put it this way. The longer the regime lasted, the more the opposition was losing support, losing people's interest. Many people backed out, they'd had enough. We worked hard doing those newspapers, even doing radio. Okay, they turned the lights on and off and walked. Nothing had changed. It was worse every day. And each of us had to look after some sort of everyday normal life too. I had a day job. I had a family that I had to provide for, just like normal people. But I'd leave my work at 4 p.m. and start living my whole other life until late. It cost me an incredible amount of time. <laughs> well, actually, all my time. If I could take five days off per year, I was more than happy not having to check secret mailboxes, write letters. I always had eight to twelve people to coordinate writing to them individually all the time. And then there were the finances. It was a nightmare. Nightmare. One of my jobs was to keep their spirits up, so I had to be a bit of therapist, let's say. I'd visit people and try to convince them what we were doing made sense. Also, as their boss, I was trying to keep the organization rolling on full throttle all the time. Every task was super urgent, critical, immediate. I had to hold it all by the throat. But at the same time, I knew that if they arrested me, I'd go straight to prison. But what I feared most was the criminal nature of this regime. I was afraid of being kidnapped, like some of my friends. These are commonly known stories. For example, Miretsky, who was kidnapped as if by bandits in the mafia-style way of the street. They put a bag on his head, took him to a villa outside of Warsaw, beat him up and interrogated him. Or maybe they take me to one of the nearby forests and try drown me in a swamp. What would I do then? Especially after those 1986 arrests, when Bujak and some of my friends went to jail, I was absolutely convinced I was going to be arrested. I even cleared out my apartment and burned all the documents in the toilet. I was thinking, why should I make the prosecutor's work easier and keep evidence at home? My friend Janek was sentenced to three years for broadcasting our shows and they sentenced him in less than 48 hours. That's the risk I was facing. Well, actually, as a leader, I could expect four or five years maybe. I don't know, no idea. Luckily, I missed out on that. 
Ja szczerze powiedziawszy też miałem już całkowicie tego dosyć. To co pamiętam... To be honest with you, I'd had enough of the whole thing. From what I remember those last years, 1987, 88, 89 were completely exhausting. And I don't, I don't know how some kind of extreme stubbornness stopped me giving up. Nie ustąpisz, nie. Never let up. Nie, przetrwamy. Just make it true. Bóg był łaskaw. And we did. God had mercy on us. Kosztowało mnie to sporo nerwów. It cost me a lot of my nerves, but that was normal in the underground. Most people were, you know, mm, I used to call it a mental asylum. Clearly, I had to be insane too, given I managed to get through it all. No, a kiedy przed 89 rok, no to... And when the year 1989 finally came, it was supposed to be a new Poland. But at that point I'd learned one thing, that I was no longer interested in political activity of any kind. No, no musiałem z czegoś żyć. But of course I had to earn a living. No i tyle. I założyłem własną firmę w związku z So I started a company. I had no money, but I had an idea. I was a chemist. Wasn't stupid, still in good shape. So I came up with a chemical that my company could produce and it worked for the next 19 years. Those first few years I worked like crazy. Before my days in the underground, I never had thought I'd be capable of bearing such stress, tension and such intensity without a break. But then I'd never have thought that I'd work for so long and be a CEO for so long. And for those first few years, I was the kind of CEO who's also a warehouse worker, a porter, one who stands by the conveyor belt and works till they drop. With all these chemicals too, my back is completely ruined today. But it was a success. God was kind to me again. But after those 19 years, I started feeling a little like my body needed a break. I couldn't sleep. I was always thinking about something. Was delivery on time? Was this okay? Was that in order? I felt like I did back with all the crazy people in the underground. Didn't I confuse the code word? Did I miss a meeting? For 30 years I was living in a grinder. And suddenly I decided I didn't want to live like that anymore. I sold my company, all my shares, and I had more than 25% at the time. And I moved here, to this remote place, Suwalszczyzna. And I'm happy about it. This episode of The Final Curtain was produced for Culture PL and hosted by Adam Zawawski and me, Itan Reisner. If you want to learn more about the story you just heard, see the show notes in your podcast app or go to the Stories from the East and West website at sftew.com. Make sure to subscribe or check our feed next week. You'll get to know a man who secretly filmed the first large anti-regime protest in the former GDR from the top of a church steeple.